Okay, so maybe we'll just start. So <coughs> we were talking about rational maps. So I will brief recall and then we uh, we finish it. So <coughs> So rational maps were morphisms defined on an open subset. So if uh, phi from x to y, a rational map um, between varieties uh, will be an equivalence class of pairs So where u is open in x, and phi is a morphism from u to y. And uh, we had then seen that um, we also have the largest open set, the, uh, the largest such u, u will be called the domain. And um, then we had defined uh, what it means for a rational map to be dominant. So phi is dominant if its image is dense in Y. I know. <coughs> And as, we, uh, as I mentioned, this is necessary because we can only compose dominant uh, rational maps because otherwise it might happen that uh, the image of the first map lends into the part where the second map is not defined. Um, and so if the first map is dominant, so see, And uh, the second, we have another rational map. Then we can make the f composition. You we'll just find that if you take the inverse image uh, of the intersection with the of the domain of this with the image, uh, then this will be an open subset in in X, and we can define the map there. And in particular, we can define, so if um, F is an element in KX, this is the same as saying, this is equivalent to F being a rational map to A1. So we can pull back rational functions Namely, we can say that phi star of f, so maybe now for this it would have to be in y, um, is just the composition. So this is if phi is a, yeah, for phi from x a 1. So this is a rational function. <coughs> so we can pull back rational functions. And this is more or less, uh, so we also had defined what it means to be a birational morphism, uh, a birational map. So this is a rational map which has a rational map as inverse. But now we want to talk about uh, the relation of um, rational maps and maps on the function fields. This is the following theorem. So now we start with a new thing. So let x and y be varieties. Um, so there's a, we have a bijection between the uh, dominant rational maps of 
from x to y um, to the k algebra homomorphisms from ky to kx. Well, and uh, the map is given by the pullback. So phi is sent to phi star. So we have in particular that two rational maps are equal if they give the same pullback on rational functions. So in some sense, and you know, so in particular, And we'll see this later also. We have that x and y are birational if and only if kx is isomorphic to ky. But we will see this later. So that so if one talks about uh, varieties up to birational isomorphism, it's the same as just talking about the function fields. OK, let's try to prove this. I don't give a completely complete proof. I will give the inverse map to, to this map. So we have a map which associates to a dominant rational map the pullback. And now we want, if we have, are given a K algebra homomorphism, we are supposed to find a dominant rational map of which, for which it is the pullback. So we construct. The inverse to this map phi maps to phi star. And then one has to check in detail that it is indeed the inverse. So, so we start with the K algebra homomorphism. So let theta from KY to KX be a K algebra homomorphism. And we have to find a rational map. So we want to construct a map phi from uh, x to y which corresponds to it, so the, of which it is the pullback. Um, now, if we replace y by an open affine subset, so we take an open subset here, which is smaller than y, and we can even find the phi instead of from x to y, instead to this open subset, we certainly have found it. You know, with the inclusion into y, we also have found a, morphism, a, a rational map to y. So we can as well assume that y is a fine. And once it sets, it's isomorphic to some closed subset of some affine space, we can as well assume that it is actually a closed subset of a fine space because we just compose with the isomorphism. So we assume that y is is closed. Okay. So then, obviously, the advantage is that we know how you know, we can characterize morphisms to y. Um, but anyway, so let's see. Um, so anyway, we, li we are in An, so we have the coordinates on An, which I call y1 to yn, and we take them as functions. I mean, the restrictions to y are the coordinate functions. So let y1 to yn be the in 
a y be the coordinate function. And now we basically do the same thing we did before when we, you know, this <coughs> is similar to previous statement about morphisms between affine varieties. No? We do the same as there that we use the, you know, the thing, uh, when we apply it to the coordinates, we will get the coordinates of the map. So, um, at least that's the hope. So let, so therefore, thus, uh, theta y1 until theta of yn. So if these are elements in Ay, they are certainly regular functions on y. And so the pullback, so regular functions are certainly re rational functions, so the pullback will be a rational function. So these will be some elements in Kx. Um, but if they are rational functions, then for each of them, there is an open subset on which they are regular. And if I take the intersection of all these open subsets, we find an open subset where all of them are regular. So, so there exists an open, non-empty, in X, such that theta of yi is regular for all i, from 1 to n. So then I claim that this proves that uh, theta y1 to yn from u. Do you want to do no, I, I make it. Yeah, here I've said different thing. So this thing is a to y is a morphism. No? Um, but I can also say it uh, differently. So I could also say that if I want to refer to a, a previous theorem, we have that theta defines an um, injective, no, but maybe I leave it like this. So this is a morphism. Well, maybe I don't. So maybe, I, so this is true, but I can say it in a, in a different way. So theta defines an injective homomorphisms, homomorphism of uh, key algebras uh, from uh, A of Y to OX of u, namely if I have any, so I don't, uh, if I have any polynomial in the yi, then theta of it is the corresponding, you know, polynomial in the theta of yi, which lies in ox of u. And then we had this, had this theorem that if we have a homomorphism of k algebras, this defines us a morphism like here. But we also have, <coughs> so which gives us this morphism by the theorem gives a morphism u to y. And uh, now it is an exercise which, uh, however, this time I did not give you, but it's an easy exercise which you can check, that the fact that this morphism is injective implies and in fact is equivalent to the statement that the image 
of, so that the fact that this homomorphism is injective is equivalent to the fact that this morphism here has dense image. So to show um, that theta is injective implies that uh, the image of this map from u to y is dense. So first, why is this uh, map, this theta injective? Well, you know, it is, we have a homomorphism of fields from uh, ky to kx, and it's not the zero homomorphism, so therefore it is injective. Because every morphism, you know, every homomorphism of fields is either the zero homomorphism or it is injective. Because, uh, you know, the kernel is an ideal. And there are no ideals. And so this is, um, and so we take the restriction. So, and this A, AY is just a, a subring of, uh, of, of KY. So certainly, if it was injective before, if I restrict it, it's still injective. Um, <coughs> And this fact is quite uh, simple. You can just see that if um, um, that uh, somehow <coughs> the kern, I mean, it's, it's quite, uh, you know, it's really an easy exercise to check that if this homomorphism is injective, then the image will be dense because um, Basically, um, <clears throat> how shall I put it? So the, you find somehow that the, the closure of the image is precisely the locus where the kernel here vanishes, you know, something like that. So anyway, it's very easy to check. And uh, if you, uh, you can also easily uh, try to, to do it yourself. So now, but this means, therefore, uh, thus, we find we have a, a morphism phi from u to y. Uh, which is dominant. The image is dense, and so it's a rational map phi from x to y. And, you know, you know the, the statement was also before here, when you say that Theta defines an injective homomorphism of K algebras in this way. Uh, so if I call that maybe phi, no, uh, which uh, by the theorem gives a morphism phi from u to y. So how does it give the morphism? This the statement was precisely it gives a morphism with the property that the pullback of by it is the theta. No? So when we had this theorem about uh, how you know morphisms of affine varieties, uh, how they it is related to um, homomorphisms of the K algebras. The statement was that we have a bijection between them, precisely in such a way that the pullback uh, is the corresponding homomorphism of K algebras. And so we find that at this level, the pullback is is this. And so it's easy to reduce from that that also here the phi star is equal to theta. Anyway, so the details you can check yourself. And to, uh, then one has to, I mean, it's an, an exercise to check also the, the converse that um, if you compose them the other way, you get also the identity. Okay, so this is this statement. So basically, we have kind of reduced it to the previous result for 
fine varieties. Now I want to see what this has to do, uh, how this works for birationality. So I had already given uh, the statement that it follows from this that x and y are birational if and only if kx is isomorphic to ky as k algebras. And now we want to prove a slightly more, slightly more. So, uh, so that x and y are again varieties. Then the following are equivalent. First, uh, x and y are birational. Second one is that x and y contain open subsets which are isomorphic to each other. So there are non-empty open subsets. Um, U and X, V and Y such that U is isomorphic to V. And the last one is that indeed Kx is isomorphic to Ky as K algebras. Okay, so in some sense, it seems kind of, you know, it seems kind of obvious that these three should be uh, equivalent. Um, I mean, more or less, uh, what we just proved uh, will imply uh, that one and three are equivalent, more or less. And um, this statement is kind of also clear because uh, you know a birational map is a is a morph a rational map is a, is a morphism on an open subset, and it's birational if it has an, an inverse, which is a rational map. So you can imagine that it will be open two open subsets which are isomorphic. So let's uh, carry this out. So. So we assume that x and y are birational. So and now we want to show that there are such two non-empty open subsets. So let phi from x to y be a rational map, birational map with inverse. I write it C. From, but it's just phi to the minus one, where it is defined from y to x. And so some, we take, for instance, the domain of phi. So we know that if I take the composition psi composed with phi, this will be, where will this at least be defined? I mean, what is an open set where it is defined? For one thing, we must have that phi is defined. So is defined on uh, the domain of phi. But domain of phi. So we need that. And we also need that then once we map from there, we end in the dom domain of psi. Okay, and um, okay, so if we apply, and in the same way, if I take phi composed with psi, this is defined on the domain of psi intersected with psi to the minus one times the domain of phi. And we can see if we 
apply now, if we take phi and apply it you know, from the domain of phi, intersected phi to the minus one domain of psi, this will uh, you know, map this to this one. You know, because if I apply phi to it, then this gets mapped into the domain of phi. And uh, you know, <clears throat> so I claim this maps to the domain of psi intersected psi to the minus one domain of phi, so, which is the same as um, so psi to the minus one. Okay, let's see. No, no, I, now we have to see why it is true. And if not, then it will be, maybe I shouldn't, uh, yeah, okay. So we apply, so if you apply phi to, I mean, if you apply phi to this, we certainly are mapped to, to this one. If you apply phi, What? Hmm? Yeah, so the idea is that this should be the, so now I'm not quite sure. So I want to say that it maps to this one. Because that is. <laughs> well, you know, that certainly. Um, Yeah, but you know that is not what I want. That certainly is true. <laughs> okay. Um, but you know, so you know, here's psi. So what do I have here? Let me just see. So I apply phi to this. Okay. If I apply phi to this, I get the domain of, of psi. And then <clears throat> no, psi to the And now we apply, uh, okay, I mean, so here we would have just intersected phi of the domain of phi, but, uh, <clears throat> okay. And I want to say that phi is just, if we are, you know, phi is just psi to the minus one, hmm? where, you know, you know, so the map, so where the inverse, so where phi is defined, it's the inverse of psi, of psi. So I think it is, you know, this is the same. Anyway, so if we are given this, so then it means we have these two sets. We have the map phi between them, and we have obviously psi goes the other way around. To the other one.
So then what is written here says precisely that phi and psi are inverse to each other as mapped from here to here. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a misprint. No, no, that's actually false. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. It was a misprint, but not the same. Okay. So, so this statement just this fact just says. Um, so this is defined here, and this is defined here, and they are, go like this. And you know where both where it is defined, this composition is the identity. No. And they are the identity here. Because after all, this was supposed to be the inverse. Wherever the composition is defined, it is the identity. So we find that phi and psi go from one set to the other, and the compositions are the identity. So these two sets are isomorphic. Thus, uh, well, this is thus the isomorphic. So we have that this intersection, the domain of psi intersected to psi to the minus one domain of phi is isomorphic to the corresponding thing with phi and psi exchanged. So this was the only uh, slightly non-trivial part. So we have found this open subset. And now, um, uh, so this proves two. So two to three is obvious. Because uh, by definition, if I take an open subset of a variety, it has the same function field. In this case, so kx is isomorphic to ku. And with our definition, they are even, even equal. And uh, ky is isomorphic to KV. And obviously, if U and V are isomorphic, then KU is isomorphic to KV. And uh, the last one, 3 goes to 1, is basically what we proved uh, in the previous theorem. So if KX and KY are isomorphic as K algebras, then we know that X and Y are birational because if we are given an isomorphism, we have for that a rational ma uh, by rational map from x to y. So, <clears throat> okay. So we had. Uh, Last time, this example of the cuspidal cubic, which you maybe recall um, that um, uh, I take a curve C equal to the zero set of y squared minus x to the three, that this is not isomorphic. C is not isomorphic to A1, but they are birational. And in particular, you find that the function field of this is just the, you know, kx, the, uh, the field of rational functions in one variable. Okay, but I mean this example we briefly did last time. So now I want to come to one specific example of um, birational um, morphisms, actually. So. The birational morphism is a morphism which does not necessarily, which is also birational, but it doesn't necessarily have an actual inverse which is defined everywhere. And the kind of most standard, uh, uh, the most typical example of that is the so called blow up. Okay? So I will uh, briefly introduce the blow up, <coughs> and then um, I will. Um, so the, maybe just in a small special case, it's a very general uh, thing, what, you know, the blow up. Um, and we will look what it does to 
You basically just do it for blowing up a point in A2. And then we'll briefly see what it does to curves in the point, you know, which pass through that point. So So this example, this is an example. So it's the main example of birational morphism. Um, so this is a, can maybe say a few words about that is a, so blow ups are a quite general construction. So <clears throat> you have for instance the notion of if, um, um, so if x so these are just things I say, so I will not make it precise. So if x is an affine or projective variety, and one can blow up, can uh, and say and. Um, Um, see, I is an ideal either in the coordinate ring of X or in the homogeneous coordinate ring of X, so in the final projective case, you can say you can, can blow up. Um, X along I. Um, <clears throat> but I will not maybe define this. But somehow you can, if you want, you can <laughs> so blow up. Uh, you can either, so if you want to have a picture in your mind, you can either think that you have really some kind of pump and you, you have a, at a point and you make something much bigger there. Or you can even view it much more, much more drastically that you, there's some place in X where you put a bomb and you make it explode and you look where the pieces fly. And so somehow it's a way to look at some small part uh, of the variety like under a very big microscope. So what happens very near to the point you can see uh, very large. <coughs> or oh, it becomes very large. Um, <coughs> So, but we will only consider uh, the blow up of A2 in the origin. Okay, so that's very simple. So, how does that uh, go? Where do we have it actually? So this I can just write down, so definition. So on A2, take um, uh, with the coordinates x and y. And uh, on A2, and in P2, P2, we say we take the homogeneous coordinates P1. Um, say I call them T and U. Okay. And then the blow up is something which lives in the product. So the blow up A2 hat of A2 at zero is uh, the following. So it's a zero set 
of x u minus y t in a2 times p1. So <clears throat> what? A two hat, yes. So this is defined to be A two hat, and this is A two hat, yes. So um, I should maybe say we didn't precisely have that. This is a closed sub. This is a closed uh, subset of um, a two times p one. This doesn't directly follow from what we said, but it's an easy exercise to you know prove we proved something very similar for closed subsets of p n times p m. Uh, so, um, so the closed subsets of a n times p m are the zero sets so z of f one to z f r where the f i so if the coordinates on a n, I call x1 to x n, on p m, y1, y0 to y m, then these are uh, polynomials in x1 to x n, y0 to y m, which are homogeneous in the variables which live on some projective space and no condition on these variables, so homogeneous. in the yi. And the proof is basically the same as what we uh, did when we proved uh, that um, what the closed subsets of a p n times p m is. And so in particular, we find that this thing, you know, as it's a zero set of polynomial with this property, is closed in a 2 times p 1. So we take pi. Um, which is just the first projection from uh, a2 hat to a2 is the blow up map. And we call E the inverse image of the origin. So I just write 0 for the point 0, 0. And it's called the exceptional divisor. That's how it's called. I mean, <laughs> at the moment, that doesn't make much sense, but that's how it is called. <laughs> um, so so we, we want to see that. Uh, Pi is a birational morphism um, if I take pi restrict it to a two hat minus e. is an isomorphism. And uh, well, it's obvious from the definition that E is just equal. If you look at it, it's a zero set of x times u, y, t, where now x and y are both supposed to be 0, no? because we take we are over the origin. So that means, but then, you know, it's a zero set of nothing. So it is just the whole of P1. So E is just equal to zero times P1. So in particular, uh, 
here the map is not an isomorphism on, on E. So everything kind of stays unchanged outside, uh, outside zero, but over the point zero, we have a whole line P1. And one should think of this P1 as all the directions that you can have in the origin. Okay. As I said, uh, if you want to have this slightly uh, uh, violent uh, viewpoint on, on the uh, glow up, it's really, if you put a bomb in the origin, these are all the directions into which the pieces can fly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So this is therefore a birational morphism, but not an isomorphism. So let's see in more detail that happened. So now <clears throat> we want to we want to first see the state. So it's clear that E is equal to zero times P1. But we might want to see now that this map is indeed an isomorphism. So first, so we take a, a point. So I just write the coordinates uh, in x and y for the coordinates of the points, even though I could call them a, b, and so on. So we take a point in a2 without the exceptional divisor. So that means that this point is not, the po this x and y are not both zero. So somehow by symmetry, it somehow will look the same whether it, it is x or y. So not both of x and y are zero, so we can assume that say x, which one do I want? We can assume that x is not zero. Can assume. So if we are on this A2 hat, it means that this equation is fulfilled. So we have we, we have x u is equal to y t, and is x is not zero, we can also say that uh, u is equal to uh, y divided by x times t. Or equivalently, if I take the point in projective space, which is given by the pair x, y, this is the same as this point in projective space. So x, u. Okay, this holds anyway, independent of whether it is x which is non zero. Okay. So we see from this we have indeed a morphism. So thus um, a two head. is the graph of the morphism um, say from A2 so I don't know how it's from A2 without zero to uh, E1 point uh, x, y, so it's just given by x, so we have that x, y is mapped to x, y. Now because we see precisely that the, the, the points are precisely the pairs of x, y, and to u such that the, if I take the image point, x, y is equal to the second coordinate. So it's precisely the graph of this morphism. So, <clears throat> so 
so we will <coughs> in fact we would see that uh, a two hat is irreducible thus a two hat is the closure of the graph. In fact, you can always uh, view the blow up of anything like that, that you, if you blow up an ideal or whatever, you can always define a, a irrational map. Um, so if you, I haven't defined to you what in general the blow up is, but you can always define it in such a way that you have some rational map and uh, which is defined uh, somewhere and you take the closure of its graph. That is the blow up. So now we want to, so I'm just describing this. No, it's not a big, uh, um, so now I want to see that this thing, A2 hat, has a cover by two uh, open subsets, each of which is isomorphic to A2. So we have kind of two charts. No, so it's, um, so we want to see A2 hat is a cover by two open subsets. Uh, isomorphic to A2. And I can just, um, so I still, you know, recall that uh, A2 hat. Where do I want to write so that we have it? Okay, so we keep it in mind. <coughs> so we can take, as a one open subset, we take Vt to be equal to A2 hat minus the zero set of T. So T is uh, one of the coordinates of P1. And I claim this is isomorphic to A2 in the most obvious way. So how can I write this? Well, if the t coordinate is non-zero, I can put it equal to one. So this can be written as a set of all x, y uh, one comma u in a two times p one, such that you know this relation x u is equal to y t, t is 1, so that um, <coughs> y is equal to x u. So I can write it like that. <coughs> but that means, what does, if I take the map from Vt to A2, which sends such a thing, uh, to just uh, x comma u, then you know, it's given in a nice way by coordinate this is actually a morphism and it is an isomorphism why is that because we can write down the inverse map 
you know, if we know x and u, we know what y is. No? And they are given just by, again, by polynomials with inverse. Um, so x u is mapped to, you know, what is it? x comma x u uh, one comma u. And in the same way, obviously, when u is non-zero. Same way. The U uh, is isomorphic to A two via the corresponding map. Um, so if I take x, y, so a point here will look as x, y, and uh, t comma 1. No, because the u is 1, uh, would be mapped to x comma t. And then you can con reconstruct in the same way as before the tuple, so it's also an isomorphism via this map. Okay, so we have, a, so thus, <coughs> we have a cover by, so, you know, A to hat is equal to V U, V T, U, U, and H, each of them is isomorphic to uh, A2. And uh, <coughs> so, <coughs> just see. To just check. And it's, um, it's an exercise if um, so if X um, has an open cover um, x equal to u1 union u2 where the ui are irreducible and uh, u1 intersected u2 is non-empty uh, then it follows that x is irreducible this is very easy to prove. You just use the definitions and you find that. So this applies here. So we find that A2 hat is irreducible. Anyway, so we have these nice charts. So this is um, how one will want to to use the blow up to, to somehow change the original charts x and y on A2 by the charge x and u, which somehow is finer. And uh, <clears throat> we find we want to, we need to just be able to describe what the exceptional divisor is in these charts. So um, So in 
So if we look uh, at this uh, so so in these coordinates so in so I should say I, I want to say it again so a2 is the union of two open subsets isomorphic to A2. And in fact, one is A2, so which is uh, so open subsets Vt and Vu, which are isomorphic to A2, namely the first one, Vt, is isomorphic to A2 where I have the coordinates with coordinates what are the coordinates here x and u and vu is isomorphic to a2 where the coordinates correspond to uh, the coordinates uh, is it x and t Uh, y and t. I didn't do it here, but it can, the coordinates come out y and t. <coughs> and so um, we can kind of work with these coordinates. <coughs> so we find, for instance, in Vt, uh, the exceptional divisor E, so the exceptional divisor is all the points where both x and y are zero, is just the zero set and in Vu it will be the zero set of y. So, I mean, that's somehow, if one knows a little bit more, this is the, the reason why this thing is called divisor, because in, um, you know, later a divisor will be essentially something like the zero set of one equation, of one polynomial in some other variety, and we see that out of a point, which is not the zero set of one thing, we get the exception divisor is a zero set of one coordinate. Okay, the exception divisor is this. <clears throat> and so now we want to, so we have somehow the description. And uh, so finally, uh, if one looks at, I, I just now look in the coordinate in Vt. So in Vt, the projection pi from um, a2 hat, so rather from vt to a2 is given, you know, it's just that all this stuff is mapped to, uh, to this tuple. So it means uh, this is given by uh, x, u, uh, now the coordinates on this a2, is mapped to x, comma, x, u. Okay? So we find that, so one, we find an, an open subset which is isomorphic to a2, and its projection to the actual a2 is given by this map. So the coordinate we, you know, we locally describe this thing also as an A2, but the coordinates are different, and the, the map is not uh, the identity. And so <clears throat> we can use this to, now we want to see, so that one can have some vague idea why this could be useful, what the blow-up does to curves in the plane. So 
what does so so example what does the blow up do to curve C uh, in A2 through the origin, so which contains this point. So how does it change? So what do I mean by what does it do to it? So we want to compare the curve C to the closure of, uh, you know, we take the inverse image here, but we take only the closure of the points which lie outside the exceptional divisor. So, so we call, so let uh, C absolute A2 be a curve. So the strict transform of C is C hat, which is actually is, can also be used as some blow up, which is the closure of um, P to the minus one of C without zero in A two hat. Okay. So I mean, <clears throat> okay. So we want to see what happens for some curves. We just look at two examples. So the first one we take C. So so let C be the zero set of F, where F is a nodal cubic. So F is equal to say y squared minus x squared times x plus 1. So you can see we have a double zero here at 0 and uh, another zero at 1. This will lead to the following picture. If I just look at the real points, then so here if x is equal to minus 1, so we will have somehow it looks like this, where this is the origin. This is the point minus 1, 0, and then it goes like this. So it will somehow look like this. This is the point zero, 0, So the real points look like this, and you can somehow see that something kind of not so nice happens at this point. And so we can try to, we want to compute what is the uh, strict transform. <clears throat> so So we look just uh, look at the straw you know, in the chart t different from zero that is in v t. We see that the pre-image, so pi to the minus one of c, is just the zero set of uh, you know this f composed with uh, with p. No? And so uh, what does it give me? You know, I just have to, the map was given by this. So it just means I put y equal to xu and see what I get. So this is just equal to um, the zero set of uh, x squared times uh, u squared minus x plus 1, if I'm not mistaken. So just the point is just to put uh, y equal to x u, and then hopefully it comes out correctly. No, it comes out correctly. So it looks like this, and you know that the zero set. So this is equal to the zero set of x squared union the zero set of u squared minus x plus one, and this thing as we know, is the exceptional divisor. And so we see 
And this thing is obviously irreducible. If you look at it, it's just a quadratic polynomial like that. So this is the strict transform of C. And you can see that this thing is actually, isomorph is actually isomorphic to A1. Namely, where am I? Um, you just um, I didn't write it. Oh, yes. So I claim this is isomorphic to A1. So if I have the map from C hat to A1, which sends a point with coordinate x u to u, then I claim this is an isomorphism with inverse. So we just take the projection to this u factor with inverse. Well, we have to reconstruct it. So uh, T maps to T squared minus 1 comma T. No, the, if U is equal to, or if you want U is mapped to U squared minus 1 comma U, because the, the X will be equal to U squared minus 1 if, uh, you know, obviously. And so therefore, this thing is isomorphic to A1. So we somehow see that C has become simpler. You know, this thing is certainly not isomorphic to A1. It has this, this point, which is special. In fact, you know, one would call this a singular point when one knows what that is. And uh, here, it is just, uh, you know, it just becomes A1 after blowing up. So we have used this blowing up to simplify the curve to make it nicer. And one can even kind of make a, a picture if we have the, uh, so this would be the, the curve. And in the blow up, we get one point for every tangent direction at this point. So we find that there's a, now there's this whole line, which is the exception divisor. And you know, this intersection in the, the curve somehow will look you know, like this, lying over it, intersecting in two points. And so this is just an A1, and this thing is the exceptional divisor, no, which we throw away. So we have, you know, out of the single, we have kind of pulled this apart to, to make it smooth. And we can have another small example, which is the Casper cubic, which is very similar. So I should maybe mention, it's easy to check. So I've done now everything, done everything in this chart, t is different from 0. No? In principle, we have to also look at the other chart. But it's easy to check that the strict transform is contained in Vt. So it will not happen that uh, the u, the, the, you know, u equal to 0 is not allowed, as you can also see. I mean, no. Um, so t equal to zero will not be. Uh, we, the, there will be no points in the you know except those on the exceptional divisor which lie in u equal to zero. So therefore, it's enough to just look at this chart. But in general, it could be different for other curves. And uh, so, if you have the Casper cubic. which you have seen many times. So C, I call it again, C is the zero set of y squared minus x to the 3. Then we can do uh, the same thing again. We again look in the, so in the chart, 
uh, t different from 0, uh, so on, on vt, we have uh, now the coordinates are t and x again, and, we've, and u, and we find that, uh, so the inverse image will be the zero set of x squared times, uh, say, x, well, times u squared minus x. No? You just. What? Yeah, yeah, precisely. And that's what it says. And uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, yeah, no, certainly. It should be obvious. It's not supposed to be a miracle. And, uh, <clears throat> and so we again have that the strict transform. So you can see it's just a parabola. This is just, is obviously again isomorphic to A1. In this case, as you know, if you take the real points, the picture downstairs looks like this. And uh, here we have the exceptional divisor is like this, and the curve will be a parabola which is tangent to it. But again, it's a smooth curve, and we can see that. So I mean, it goes the map pi. OK. So in general, so we have seen in these two cases that the curve has somehow become simpler by blowing up. In fact, what you, um, I mean, if one knows what it means in general to blow up in you know, any kind of variety, also after already having blown up, one can prove, for instance, that one can make any curve into a smooth curve, whatever that means. But you know that really locally, that is a manifold in the complex topology by repeatedly blowing up. And more generally, that is a very big uh, theorem. I haven't told you what. Um, what it means, but I told you one can blow up ideals in, in a variety. And there's a general theorem that if you have any variety, now I've, I've not told you what it means for a variety to be non-singular, but over the complex numbers, you can, you know, it means it's a manifold, huh? or a complex manifold. And there's a general theorem, which is extremely difficult to prove, that you can, um, if you have any variety over the complex numbers, you can blow it up repeatedly in some ideals, and it becomes a manifold. Okay? And this is a very useful theorem. Somebody by Hironaka who won the Fields Medal for it, so it's really difficult. And, uh, but anyway, <coughs> so you see that it is a, you know, a big uh, thing. And it <coughs> Yeah, yeah. Again, it's a subset of Vt. I mean, I was implicitly using it. So again, well, then you have uh, you have to look at both charts. You no, know? there would be so. <clears throat> if uh, C hat does not lie in Vt, it means that you know that you you have to describe C hat by both charts. So you find a, a part which is over U, which is in VU and one in VT, and both of which describes an open subset of, of the curve. No? But, uh, <clears throat> so, I mean, this, uh, this can... Uh, I don't know whether I can uh, get one. Uh, so have to see where it comes from. So, um, so this would correspond. So I have to kind of remember everything. So, um, 
<laughs> I don't know whether. Yeah, yeah, maybe I will do it next time because I, I don't like to to kind of think when there are witnesses who see me trying to think. Uh, So, I mean, <clears throat> so, you know, she had was supposed to be the closure of uh, the inverse image minus uh, the exceptional divide. Now, here we have something irreducible, and you know, all the points except for actually these, uh, you know, Finitely many in this case, precisely two, uh, lie out. You know, you have a you have a, this C hat is a closed subset of A two, and it contains so all the points except for uh, uh, for two are in you know are actually the outside the exceptional divisor. So therefore, it is the closure of that set. I mean, you know, the, this open subset is dense. You know that if you have a, so this is an open subset of, so if I take um, um, g of u squared minus x plus one, and I assume that with uh, and uh, intersected, so without the zero set of x, no, this is this is equal to uh, the inverse image of C um, without so intersected with uh, so of C without zero. No, and this is an this is an open subset of uh, of the zero set. And so if this thing is irreducible, then they are, then the, the closure of this is obviously this. Hmm? But this, the closure in VT, I guess. Yeah, so if I, this is the closure in VT, yes. I mean, the claim is that if I take the, the closure in, um, yes, but, uh, I mean, the point is that um, <clears throat> so let me see. Well, I mean, OK. Well, I mean, <clears throat> So this is, you know, so obviously, so this is by itself the closure in VT. That is true. But now, um, uh, <clears throat> if I take the zero set of this, this will be entirely con contained also in VT and closed there. And it will, even if I take the closure of this set in, uh, in the other set, it will, so if I take the closure of this thing in, um, so the claim is also that if I take the closure of this, so I mean the inverse image of that, in, so the, the, the thing in, uh, so if I take the closure of that in A2 hat, so I claim that this thing is also closed in A2 hat. And you, know, you can just see, if you look in the other chart, what it means, you find that uh, it, you know, there's no, it does not contain, if you take the closure, if you look at the zero set of that in the other chart, you find that it does not contain any point which does not lie in, in VT. No? Okay, but you know, there's many things, ma many small things to check. So I have only done part of it. Okay, so then, uh, 
So therefore, where was I? Okay, so it doesn't, yeah, now you can also ask more questions because now I can definitely not start anything else. <laughs> um, okay, so this, um, otherwise I just say that, uh, so this finishes this, uh, this chapter. No? So uh, with this I have uh, talked enough about morphisms and uh, rational maps and so on. And now the, now we will in the next chapter talk about dimension. So uh, we had already defined dimension, which was uh, somehow, if you remember, so very briefly we defined it. If you have a chain of, uh, say, irreducible, if you say you have an, a variety, then the dimension of the variety will be the biggest number so that there's a chain of irreducible closed subsets of, of that length. And uh, <clears throat> Now we want to somehow prove something about dimension. For instance, we want to prove that the dimension of the n is n, or you know, many other such things. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so uh, we couldn't, we, to do this, we want to use morphisms. So we want to somehow, uh, basically the point, you know, what you can imagine is if you have a morphism, then you should expect that the, you know, if you have a surjective morphism from A to B, from X to Y, you would expect that the dimension of X is bigger or equal to that of Y, you know, that you would think, not even. Um, or if the morphism has finite fibers and is surjective, you would expect that they have the same dimension. I mean, that's, uh, you know, what you would think what dimension means. And so we will uh, actually prove something slightly weaker. So if you have something which is called a finite morphism, which is, um, which is, turns out to be a surjective morphism with finite fibers, but there might be more surjective morphisms with finite fibers, then in fact the dimension is preserved. And therefore these finite morphisms will be our, our main tool to study dimension. And so I will first have to tell you what a finite morphism is. It turns out that something you know, about commutative algebra somehow. It's defined in terms of some algebra. And so I have to introduce that. And then we will uh, prove something about finite morphisms, also that there are enough finite morphisms to serve our purposes. So there's a Neuter normalization theorem which tells us that. And then, you know, and then we will work with it. But so next time we will introduce these finite morphisms by doing the algebra and then we will really start with the dimension.